I mentioned in the last video that there are technically two buffering um, mechanisms available. Uh, the one that we've used for uh, a good long time is the API buffer server. And uh, and then there's a new one called the Pi Buffer Subsystem. It's actually a, a basic subsystem of the Pi server. And it's implemented in the PR1 version of Pi, the high availability version. And to really explain the way that works, as well as uh, how this this other works, uh, in an environment in which you're trying to maintain a highly available Pi server, we really need to study a bit what high availability means. So high availability is really just kind of a, uh, well, it's a goal. I mean, when you say high availability, we're not talking about a piece of software. We're talking about something we uh, try to attain. We're trying to make sure that the Pi server is always available, is highly available. And the way we implement that right now is through the Pi server uh, version PR1, the platform release 1. So imagine you've got a single Pi system with a Pi interface that's sending data to the Pi, the primary Pi server or our Pi server. Uh, we have a Pi buffer subsystem that's brand new that can do what we traditionally consider regular buffering. Now imagine that you now have a secondary Pi server. Okay? In this secondary Pi server, what you're doing is automatically, you know, by the mechanisms built into this high availability version of Pi, automatically any configuration changes here are propagated out to the secondary Pi server. Now that's great because it means you've got a highly available overall Pi server because it's configured in such a way that if this ever fails, then this is going to become the new primary. And since everything, everything with regard to configuration has been stored, then we're in good shape. Now what we haven't addressed yet here is that, see, we're only moving configuration over here. Let's draw in orange here data. Data, which is coming in this direction, that is not uh, replicated from the primary to the secondary. Instead, we need another mechanism. The mechanism we've chosen to use is the, well, it is the, um, what we would call n-way buffering. Okay? So, well, actually, before we get into n-way buffering, I should point out that we also have a failover mechanism for the clients, uh, the interfaces in this case, so that if we if we do have a client that fails, then uh, the other client, the other interface can start up. And there's a limited number of interfaces that support that right now. And of course, the buffering subsystem will be able to pick up that it, where it sends the proper data. But what I was hinting to bef or at before is that with a new type of buffering that we're calling n-way buffering, the, uh, this data, which had not been replicated, which had simply been sent here, is actually now going to be replicated to the secondary server. So the advantage of using this buffering subsystem is it can do that, but as it does this, it's actually doing the compression test over on the buffering side. And although it still sends all the snapshot data, it flags those snapshot values that have passed the compression test to these servers. And the benefit of that is now these servers know which PI values to archive because they've been flagged over on the interface side. And that ensures that we've gonna, we're going to have a duplicate set of data on both PI servers. Now I do want to point out that the traditional buffering uh, uh, PI BuffSS, the traditional buffer service, will also support this n-way buffering. The one thing about that though, uh, this n-way buffering is not going to be doing the data compression. It's not going to do the compression test on the interface side. So in fact, even though this may, uh, let's say that this is uh, in fact now a, uh, a traditional buffering system using uh, using the traditional uh, pi buff SS. So let's say this is that pi buff SS, or excuse me, pi buff serve dot exe. No, excuse me, technically that's actually called simply buffserve.exe. So let's pretend that this is the traditional buffserve.exe. If we are implementing n-way buffering, then that n-way buffering is not necessarily going to ensure that the data here is exactly the same data that's sent over here. And that's because although we send the same data, if the 
you know, if it happens to arrive at different times, depending on the compression test that's being done over here, the actual data on the archive is not going to be completely identical. It's good enough for most purposes, but we, after all, want a complete duplicate set of data. So that's what the Pi buffer subsystem brings that the traditional buffering doesn't bring. Uh, the other thing is you'll notice that if you are using if you are using the traditional buff serve uh, on for buffering, then you do have to configure manually uh, the n way buffering. You have to explicitly state which uh, which are the replicated servers that are supposed to get the data. Now that's something that's different because with the in the buffering subsystem because we're calling this group of of servers here a pi collective the buffering subsystem will actually interrogate the collective to figure out which are the uh, servers that are supposed to receive this data and it doesn't have to be configured manually as we would do with the pi uh, buffering service and to round out this discussion let's just uh, well let's just paint in one more eventuality here if you were to add more servers uh, the fact that the pi buffering the subsystem uh, can automatically detect that those servers are added and then uh, without any need for you to configure it, um, it, it can start to do the buffering to here as well. It basically means that you, you now have uh, a lot of flexibility as to how many servers you put in what we're calling the Pi Server Collective. Now, and of course that is a little different than if you're using the API buffer server uh, that you would have to configure manually. And then finally, the big finish, really big finish to all of this, is that all of the clients are going to uh, automatically shift their focus to whatever is the server that's uh, you know that's running. Now we can also also do some uh, load balancing if we choose to explicitly define that certain clients go to the primary and go to the secondary when all of them are available. But as I said, when one fails, then all of them go to the uh, go to the other server. So uh, let's go back to, uh, let's just take a look at our previous example, or previous table. On this table, we describe these two systems. Here's the Pi Buffer subsystem. That's the newer one. It is supported in Windows. Okay. Now let's compare that to the older version, the API Buffer Server. The API Buffer Server is supported in Windows. We also support that in Unix and Linux. So in fact, it's, you know, it's the one that's been around longer. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the one that you know, it's traditionally been used for buffering between servers, uh, whether they're Windows or Unix based. Okay. Also, the um, the supported Pi servers list is rather limited when it comes to the new one. You have to have the most recent one, the 34375 or later. That's the PR1 version uh, for the Pi buffer subsystem. Uh, for the API buffer server, all of our uh, systems will work with that, all of our versions. Now, the compression algorithm, as I mentioned, that's being done on the data acquisition node. Now, we actually still send all the snapshots, but we flag those that need to be archived so that the data is exactly the same on all the servers in the collective. But of course, with the traditional buffering, it's all done on the Pi server. There is no maximum buffering limit on the Pi buffer, buffer subsystem like there is on the API buffer server. And the speed at which we can uh, throughput data to uh, buffer that data is tremendously better in the Pi buffer subsystem. As you can see, 10 times is great. And at this point, that's really about it as far as what we're going to discuss with the Pi buffer subsystem. The balance of what we will do is going to be using the traditional API buffer server. Uh, there are much more detailed documents on implementing high availability systems and the role of the Pi buffer subsystem that's, uh, that are available than what we normally do in this class. So we're going to be showing you how to buffer using the traditional API buffer server.